Hello, 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 and welcome once again to Corpus Cast, the podcast from Aston University about corpus linguistics and what it can do for society. I'm your host, Dr. Robbie Love, and welcome to the first episode of 2024. Yay! Uh, and it's our 25th episode, so it's a, a double anniversary, if you will, because it's our second birthday. We uh, launched our first episode of Corpus Cast in January 2022. And here we are two years later with our 25th episode. So I want to uh, thank all of our guests who've joined us over the last two years as we enter our third year of Corpus Cast. And of course, I want to thank each and every one of our listeners as well um, who've joined us from over 30 countries. Uh, Not bad for a a fairly niche little uh, academic podcast. Um, And so to celebrate, I had a little dig into uh, some of our stats. And uh, over 80% of you uh, listeners joined us for the first time in 2023, which, of course, has been our second year. Um, So that's a pretty good sign, I think. Uh, And you've been going back and and listening or watching us um, uh, from the very start. So welcome and thank you. And we hope that we have uh, a lot more new listeners and viewers uh, joining us as we enter uh, 2024 as well. So happy new year. Uh, and we're kicking off 2024 with a bang. Um, as I finally uh, pinned down a guest that I've been hoping to have on Corpus Cast since the very, very beginning. Um, and uh, he's, he's, you know, been a little bit hard to pin down, but we've, we've got him eventually. And I'm very excited about it because um, I think it's going to be a really interesting episode. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the story of Antconk. Uh, one of the uh, best known and widely used and freely available corpus tools, Antconk. And of course, who better to tell us all about Antconk than its developer, Professor Lawrence Anthony. Lawrence is a professor in the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Waseda University in Japan, where he is the uh, director of the Center for English Language Education in Science and Engineering. Uh, And apart from corpus linguistics, his research interests include educational technology, natural language processing, and genre analysis. And for over 20 years, he's been developing educational software for use by researchers, teachers, and learners in corpus linguistics, including, but certainly not limited to, of course, ANTCONG. And so I'm really, really pleased that Lawrence has uh, accepted my invitation to join us to kick off our third season of Corpus Cast in 2024. So without any further ado, please welcome to Corpus Cast, Professor Lawrence Anthony. Hello, Lawrence. Yes. It's great to see you. It's great to see you too. Uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me onto the show. And I'm um, sorry it took so long for me to get here, but I <laughs> well, am really happy to be here now. Well, I'm very grateful uh, for, for you uh, coming on, very grateful for your time and, and very excited to get the chance to to learn more about the, the story behind you and your work, uh, and of course, um, perhaps what you're uh, best known for, or one of the things you're best known for being being Antconk. And so uh, I'm, I'm excited to, to take a dive into, into the story. Um, but I want to learn, I want to know more about you before we, before we move on to, to Antconk. So let's, let's sort of go back to the the beginning, so to speak, not all the way back to the beginning. We're, we're not going to get the, <laughs> the day of your birth, but but close enough. Um, so, when did you first become interested in language? Well, I've got to kind of re- um, reveal that I actually didn't really like language at school. There's one of the things I really didn't want to do. Uh, as you as you know, in Britain, we have to study languages in in secondary school. And I was forced to study French and German, uh, and then also forced to study Latin. And I didn't like any of them, and I dropped them as quickly as I could. So throughout my school life, I really didn't have any interest in language at all. I always associated myself being a scientist and maybe more precisely an engineer. Um, my, as a kid, my dream was to be an astrophysicist. That's what I wanted to do right from, from really when I was too young to even know what an astrophysicist was. I wanted to be one. So at school, I dropped all languages, and um, at high school, I studied mathematics, physics, chemistry, and electronics. I went to university and studied mathematical physics, 
And uh, my dream at that time was not to do it, nothing to do with language at all. I wanted to develop a fusion, uh, a fusion reactor, a nuclear fusion reactor, and change the world. Oh, and this new new um, energy source that would make everybody happy, make the world right. a better place. So, <laughs> and I have so, um, they, it's a very ignorant question. Has someone else done that since? Is that a thing now, or are they still working it, on that? It's the, people are still working on it. So maybe it was a good decision to not go into that because I would be working for 30 years plus and not getting any results. But actually recently there's been a lot of good um, research and some major steps forward in developing fusion reactors um, uh, in Europe. So there's some, there's some um, p positive signs there. But uh, to come back to your question though, I, came, I became interested in language really kind of by accident. Uh, I, when I was at university, I met some scientists from Japan, which is why I'm actually here now, but I met some scientists from Japan who were in, um, and their English level was really, really poor. And I was trying to talk to them about science and engineering. And I realized at that time that, you know, even if you're a good scientist or an engineer, if you don't have the ability to communicate what you're doing, you're not going to be able to make, be successful. And that kind of changed my idea about, about my life in, in some, in many ways. I thought, okay, maybe actually I don't need to change the world myself. I can maybe facilitate somebody else's work, you know, through through communication and helping them communicate what they want to do. And that's what really got me interested in language and um, science communication. Okay. Yeah. And so when did you, you studied in the UK and then you moved to yeah. Japan, but then you were mm. still studying in the UK after you'd moved to Japan, right? So when did you move to Japan and... and you know, tell us yeah. sort of, talk your sort of academic career before you got to, to Waseda. So this is it's a little bit complicated, but um, I basically went to Japan for a few times. I went for a holiday once and else I met the people um, I just mentioned before I went to Japan, but then I went to Japan for a holiday, well, kind of a holiday, kind of just an experience trip. Decided that, yeah, this is really where I, I, I can find my, my goal in life. So I went, so I finished my university studies in, at um University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, or UMIS, doing mathematical physics. I went to Japan, and then I started teaching English, basically, uh, initially, meeting people and, and so on. But then I decided, okay, if I really want to do, if I really want to help people, I need to get basically into university and do, do that kind of work. So I went back to study. I did a distance master's in TEFL and TESOL at the University of Birmingham. And then I continued and did a... a not really a distance degree. It's called a modular PhD. But I did a modular PhD also at the University of Birmingham while I was working. And while I was working, I also found my first job, which was doing science communication in a, a science and engineering university in Japan. So I was basically working in universities while I was doing my master's and PhD, which is a very lucky thing to be able to do. So, so I would... Mm, oh, oh, go ahead. Go on. No, so I, I was working in the university, University um, Okayama University of Science and Engineering uh, in the west of Japan uh, while I was doing my master's and my PhD. I finished my PhD and then I got an offer to come to Waseda University to set up their science and engineering program. Um, the, uh, so science communication in English um, for the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Waseda University. So I, and then I moved in 2004. And I've been here ever since. Oh, that's right. <laughs> and almost twenty years now. Oh, right. wow! I, 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 I won't tell you um, what I was doing in two thousand and four. I'm an old man, Robbie. I'm an old man in the field. Ah, uh, uh, well, you, well, you've got plenty, plenty of stories to tell. So, at what point did you specifically get into corpus linguistics? Then, uh, you know. I'm I'm trying to sort of get a sense of at what point did you fully make that transition from the the STEM background, if you will, more of the, yeah. the hard science into corpus linguistics, and and I suppose I'm interested in how much of the the the, the scientific background that you had has has you know informed the kind of work that you've been doing in corpus linguistics. Okay, so I wouldn't say I've ever transitioned into corpus linguistics. I actually feel that my identity has always been the same, and um, I still have that mission, uh, uh, not to develop a nuclear fusion reactor now, but to <laughs> this, this supporting of science and, scientists and engineers to communicate well, especially in terms of writing. 
So when I did my, as I said, I went back to the school and I went to the University of Birmingham to do my master's degree. And when I was doing that, uh, we, you know, we have a, a range of different courses. And one of those courses was Corpus Linguistics. And it was, uh, it was run by John Sinclair, one of the very founding fathers of Corpus Linguistics. And it really blew me away that because I was doing a lot of, you know, these new, new courses in, in humanities. And I felt that in this, these humanities courses, they're not so objective, they're not so quant quantitative, but Corpus Linguistics was different. It was almost like a, a scientific way of looking at language and really, really connected with that approach. You know, we're using computers, we're getting language, we're counting tokens and so on, making, um, well, observing the data, uh, um, interpreting the, from the data, I really connected with me. And that's really how I got interested in corpus linguistics as a method that I can apply to my, to my goal, which is to help people communicate better. So, I can... so is, that, is that what you would say, is that what you would say corpus linguistics means to you then? Yeah, it's a methodology that you can apply to make um, interesting, important findings about how language is used. And it can be applied in different areas. And I'm interested in science communication. So I would apply that methodology to the analysis of research papers, for example, or presentation language and see what people, how people write and what people say. Uh, and, and, and then I can inform you know, my, my target audience, which are scientists and engineers who are trying to publish or trying to give a good presentation. I can tell them what, what the top people in the field do. That's, that's incredible. Really. So we, we... We're going to chat, of course, about about Ankonk, which is kind of the, the main focus of the episode. But what what's really interesting is that from from my perception and perhaps, you know, the perception of quite a lot of others in the field who are not specifically working in science communication or science and engineering, um, sort of perceive you as being probably mainly through Ankonk, you know, providing a general purpose tool. Um, that can be used for all sorts of, you know, all sorts of uh, applications in, in corpus linguistics, and and so it's it's interesting that you the way that you still talk about your own identity, it's 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 not really kind of in in that area of sort of providing a, you know a corp a general corpus linguist, but Rob, you're still you know if 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 there are kind of other applications kind of incidentally that that others find useful with the tools that you make, then that's great, but you're not necessarily making them for that purpose solely but Robert you are you're still interested in in your area of science communication oh right? absolutely um yeah now because the user base of my tools is quite wide I do have to consider other people but when you're developing software the first thing you have to think about is like how you can use it um if you can't if it's not useful for yourself then it, you've got a major problem and I use this software you know in all my teaching so if it doesn't work for me, then it's going to be not working for other people too. So yeah, my identity is still basically the same as 20 years ago. And I'm using corpus tools. I happen, I happen to use my own, but I'm using corpus tools to basically understand how people communicate in science and engineering in a written form and in a spoken form. And yeah, and I teach that to, to the students. Let's go back then. You said 20 years and we're going to go back just over 20 years. Um, <laughs> from what I can, uh, I, I was not an active corpus linguist at the time, but from what I can see, <laughs> from what I can see, uh, the first version of AntConc 1.0 or 1.0, would you call it? Yeah, 1.0. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. 1. Yeah, yeah, was released in 2002. So uh, right. now we are, of course, at, as of the time of recording, yes, it's definitely January 2024 right now, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so 22 years ago. Yeah. Um, the first version of AntConc was released. So I, I suppose, you know, maybe you've already partially answered this question, but why, you know, wh where did the idea come from? What, what, what gap did you, you know, find? Why was it necessary to build a tool? And, you know, what was the context at the time that led to you developing the first version of, of AntConc? Okay, so this is kind of a, a kind of odd story, but um, I had no intention of building AntConc, really. Um, I was doing my PhD. I finished my PhD in 2002, but um, I, my PhD, the, the goal of my PhD was to develop an automatic discourse analysis tool. I was doing, I'm, I was not really interested in corpus linguistics as much as discourse analysis, and I wanted to apply corpus methods to make discourse analysis more objective and, and so on. 
And I thought my PhD would, an interesting topic would be to use AI to develop, uh, to analyze discourse analysis, discourse. Uh, but I needed to develop, uh, my idea was to develop this tool that would be able to do the analysis automatically, but I hadn't developed that kind of software before. I, um, I did program since I was a child. I've been programming since I was about 10 years old. Uh, but for this project, for the PhD, I needed to use a new programming language, which was Perl. And I wanted to develop a, a user interface that people could use and I hadn't done that before. So I needed to practice and I thought, okay, what can I practice on? How can I practice my coding? And I thought, okay, what's a, what's a simple thing to build? And I thought, a concordance, because uh, that's a, a nice, easy interface and the, the, the purpose is very clear. So I just played. I played and I built a little corpus tool. And it just so happened that yeah, I built it in Perl, which could then be used in Linux, on Linux machines, on Mac machines, and on Windows machines. And my friend, my my good colleague, Judy Noguchi, here in Japan, was happened to be teaching a class in a Linux lab. And she said, like, there's no tools around for doing corpus work, you know, just data-driven learning in the in a Linux lab. She knew about Wordsmith tools, of course, and Monocon Pro at the time. But they were on Windows machines. And she said, like, do you know anywhere where you can, do you know any Linux machine, uh, Linux software for concordancy? I said, ah, I've just made one. It was <laughs> my, as practice. So I, I compiled it for, for Linux and I sent it to her. And that's the history, that's the start of it all. You know, it was by accident almost. So um, what did it, what, you know, what did it look like, this, this first version? What, what could it do? You know, what, well, what was the functionality? So if anybody's interested, any of the listeners here are interested, you could go to my website now and go to the Ancong previous versions and you can go right back to version one and it will still run today. Oh. So please try it out. Oh, but great. Basically, it is just a concordance. Version one is really just a very basic concordance tool. You type in words and you get the quick concordance lines coming. And that's all it did. The very first wow. version is very simple. Yeah. And so it, it sounds like it was not at all the intention, you know, woke up one day, go, I'm going to build a tool that, you know, That's lots right. of corporate linguists are going to use and I'm going to Absolutely publish not. it and I want to, you know, spread it and get people around the world. So, you know, after mm. that, after, so was it the case that you, you know, you had this, this almost this just play thing that you'd made. That's right. You coded, you shared it with your colleague. How yeah. long was it before you actually publicly, you know, released the tool to, for anyone to use? Well, I did um, because I had a server and I had a, a a domain. I was able to give it to that colleague by through the through the internet. So I did upload oh, okay. it right away. So I uploaded yeah. it, and it's a funny story with this because and I uploaded it initially with the name Conk because I thought, oh, Concordance Conk. We had we had Monoconk, and I thought Conk, and I uploaded it, and I suddenly found that there's actually another tool called Conk already there online. Oh. And I thought, oh, no, I've got, I, I'm taking that person's name. So I, I took it quickly down. I thought, okay, how can I, like, I, I need a different name. What can I call this software? And I thought, okay, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, Anthony's Concordas, and then that's too long. Oh, and Conk. Let's just go with and Conk. And then I uploaded it. It took me about five minutes to decide the name for and Conk. It's just Anthony remove the, the last part of my family name and stick it on the beginning of Concordata. Yeah. And, and who would have thought, you know, 22 years later, when you go on your website and you see the list of all of the Ant tools, you know, it's like the, the yeah. Ant cinematic universe or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you'd, you'd sort of be become, uh, you know, uh, sort of almost not stuck, but, you know, every tool now has the same Ant yeah. prefix, right? Oh, no, yeah. not quite, not, not always, but... Yeah, I know. Yeah, almost time. every time. That's right. right. That's Mostly, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a kind of ironic, really, because it, you know I developed Anconk as a practice thing for my PhD software, and that software came out. It's called Antmover, but I think probably the listeners have never heard of Antmover, my PhD work, but they would have heard of Anconk, which was a, which I created just as a play thing. Um, so I'm working that, on my PhD. Is that your discourse tool? There? That's right. Yeah, it's still there on the website. People can no. try it. But um, yeah, it's quite ironic, and I think it's there's a lesson there for some people that you know when you're doing work, you never know what direction you'll go, and you'll never know what 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 will take off and be be um, important in the field. Um, so, and, and speaking of it taking off, 
you know, uh, at what point, I suppose, um, you know, 2002, it wouldn't have been as easy as it is now to kind of get data or track, you know, get a sense right. of who, who's using the tool or, or get feedback. That's How right. long was it before it became clear to you that it was becoming a tool that people more broadly were sort of finding and sort of, you know, now yeah. I, I suppose the thing is, even when I, by the time I started studying corpus linguistics, which would have been in 2012, so 10 years, you know, yeah. ANCOM was, was very much already on the list of, you know, the, the tools that people introduce students to, yeah. right? It yeah. was up there um, as we're going to practice with, here's, here's one of the main tools that we're going to use on this module, right? So right. certainly by 10 years later, you know, Lancaster was already, you know, very much, it was already very much well established and, and people were well aware of it. So how, how soon was it after the first version was released before you sort of went, oh, people seem to be finding this quite useful and maybe I should carry on developing it and adding new features. Well, it's, it's interesting that I never, because I never really set out to develop a tool that people would use, I, I uploaded it onto the internet and I didn't really track it at all. And for many years, really, um, I did, you know, I've got a server, so I can see logs and so on of the of the downloads, but I, I never really followed it. And you, it's interesting that you say 2012 is when you first saw it, because that was probably the year when I first noticed it was being used quite a lot. Um, so maybe it was... I didn't, I didn't track anything until 2012. And then in 2012, there was a Talc conference um, in Warsaw, Poland. And as part of his plenary talk, Chris Tribble did a survey of people's the, the tools that people use in the field. And he asked, I think, 800 or so people, you know, what what tools do you use in Corpus when you are using Corpora? And uh, the, the number one tool was Wordsmith Tools equally with Ancong. Oh. We, they, had the same, they had the same percentage of people using them. And then there was other tools going down the list a little bit. It really struck home to me then. It's like, oh, wow, people are actually using this um this tool and i didn't really notice it until that point until that talc conference which is probably the same time that you were first introduced to it yeah so that was that was when i started noticing that people are using it even beyond just in the in classroom use for for technical writing for example yeah uh, of course i got emails from different people over that time and and probably increasingly you know an increasing number of email requests and comments and so on and I never really took that as like growing to the extent that it was the most popular tool in Corpus work. Mm. Yeah, I, I was I was going to ask about again. Similarly, at, at what point did you notice that it was not just being used for what you had developed it for, which sounds like essentially is as as a data driven learning aid. That's right. And, and we're right. going to hear a lot more about data-driven learning in our next episode, uh, because okay. in our next episode, we have uh, Peter Crossway talking about uh, well, his, his research in, in, in data-driven learning. Um, right. But, it, but you know, it was, again, by the time I started studying corpus linguistics, it was not introduced as, this is a tool for data-driven learning. It was introduced as, this is a corpus linguistics research tool no, I... that you can use to analyze your corpus data. And so, yeah. you know, how, how did... I suppose when you, as you became more aware that people were starting to use it for all sorts of other things or, or g generic general corpus yeah. research rather than specifically right. for, for pedagogical purposes, you know, did, did that, I, I, that must have informed the, the developments you've made in, in the subsequent sort of two decades, right? If you compare the, right. the current version of the tool to yeah. the first one and the new features and developments you've made. Is that in that? I suppose that must have informed the, the changes and updates you've made over the years. Well, in, in some ways, yes, but I would say I would say that I still want to keep the core, you know, the foundation of the software. The unique identity of Anconk is that it's supposed to be easy to use. And <laughs> yeah. as, it, as you as you go towards more advanced features and functions, you you end up creating a tool that actually can be quite difficult to use for many people. So if, you, if your target audience are, are students in the classroom who maybe have never heard of corpus linguistics, teachers in the classroom who are really just wanting to use a tool for analysis, then if that's your core audience and you build powerful software for that audience, then it, hopefully people in corpus linguistics who want to use it for research can also use it and be happy. So it's, um, 
it's a ba- it, there is a balance between these because d- certainly there are needs of corpus linguists which are different from teachers in the classroom using it for a pedagogic purpose. But um, my my idea for Anconc has always been to maybe add more powerful, more useful features, but not lose that core identity as being a, an easy to use intuitive tool that can be ex- you know given to students and 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 used in the classroom. So I wouldn't say my, the identity has really changed over the time, but I have been aware that people in other fields are using it. It's very commonly used in translation studies, apparently, and I've actually given some talks to translation um, experts on how to use Ancon for that kind of analysis. Um, so I think uh, that maybe because corpus linguistics is a methodology, and it's, it's a, um, if you build a good tool for corpus linguistics, it can be used in many other fields, and if the tool is easy to use, then it can be used in the classroom too. Maybe that's where the secret. What would you say? Um, and it's interesting. You mentioned, you know, you've you've found that people using it in translation, for instance. I mean, what what are some of you know other other kind of common uses uh, uses that you again didn't you know didn't design, I mean, for, yeah. you know, but you found over the years that that people are telling you or you've noticed when they're people are publishing research and citing your tool that oh they. This oh that's interesting. Well, I I don't track any of the users, so it's actually quite difficult to establish where and how it's being used. Uh, um, I've got some interesting stories. For example, I've had emails from people in high schools in America using it to teach basic reading and writing. I'm not exactly sure how they're using that in there. I had uh, messages from Microsoft and um, company employees at Microsoft who are using it in their technical documentation. I've had uh, the Bank of England contact me once um, asking if they can use it in, in the Bank of England. I have no idea how they're using it in the Bank of England, but I've had that. And then I've had, of course, people in translation studies, um, textbook writers, publishers, and so on contacting me. So I would say any time that you're basically interacting with language, you might be you, you, there might be an opportunity to use Ancon to do the analysis. Mm. So... You know, you've as 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 we've discussed, you 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 carried on developing Damn. this tool, and, and we're now up to, I believe, version four point two point four, right? Uh, September twenty twenty three, so fairly Damn. recently. And I know you're still developing. I know there'll be the you know there'll be new new versions and updates coming. But if you you look at the the current version that, as it stands, and you compare it to one point from two thousand two. I, I'm interested particularly in what you said about keeping it simple, but also trying to, you know, add in functionality, but without compromising on the tool right. being user friendly. Mm. How, how does the tool compare? You know, what what are the yeah. sort of biggest changes? You know, the biggest developments that that you've made over the years? Okay, well, as I said, so in its, at the core, it's it is really I, I would say still the same vision the software so it, originally i wanted it to be a freeway tool uh, um, and and skip that all the way through i wanted it to be multilingual so I, i've always designed it to be to work with any language basically uh, any unicode compliant language um, and a lot of people actually ask me like how do i use ancode with german or french or, or japanese and i they say to them just just use it, it it's, there's no difference and they always get surprised about that but that's really how i've designed it and of course the basically a, a very hopefully an easy to use interface and so on so that's all the same but in terms of corpus research and i'm sure you're aware of this as well there's been a, a trend to use bigger corpora there's been a trend to use more statistics there's been a trend because the, the corpora are bigger we need faster processing and maybe also even visualization has been advancing over the years so i've been uh, uh, i made a big change to Ancon back in 2020 uh, I switched from Perl, which was the original language I, I used to create the tool. I switched to Python, which gave me a lot more options for adding new features and developing a modern interface and, and so on. So when I did that, then it did allow me to make some changes that would address these needs. So it I introduced a, a, a SQLite, uh, which is a portable database backend. Uh, so it's... Um, a relational database, an index relational database, which makes searching much, much, much faster, like completely different speed to how it used to act. Um, 
Uh, and it also has more functionality now for doing things like part of speech searching. It's got it's all built in now to the system for doing that. Um, it's got better ways now for for working with annotated data. And then because it's using Python as its back end, it's got a lot more power now to generate nicer statistical and uh, it, it can use more statistics and it can also visualize those statistical results nice more uh, better than it could before. So basically the engine that it now uses for visualizing data and calculating things is yeah, like state of the art in the field, which makes it much better easier to develop a more powerful system. So I'd say that the, the current version of Anconc is certainly the most powerful version of Anconc you will have. Uh, I would also say that I think with the introduction of these new features, some of the very simple things are slightly more difficult to do now. And people often kind of complain about like, how do we get started now? Or like, how do I load the corpora in? There's a couple more steps now in some way than there used to be. So getting started is slightly more difficult, but doing more difficult things is now much easier with the, with the latest version. So that would be the, the, the way I've gone. I've allowed more difficult things to be done in Ancon in an, a relatively easy way. Whereas before it was impossible uh, or very, very difficult. There's a couple of things I've noticed in the in the last year or two that that you introduced that seem to me to be quite big train changes from just from the end user perspective. One of them was the capacity in terms of the size of the, yeah. the corporate and you can now upload seems to have suddenly expanded. Um, yeah. I'm not sure what if there is a sort of hard limit, but it it seems that Ancon can deal with much larger data sets now than it could even two or three years ago, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, there's a funny, there's a funny story when I released it, uh, I released it on Christmas day in 2020 and very quickly, some people started uploading files and somebody said, I'm trying to upload uh, 120,000 files and it's taking a little bit of time. And I said, do you need 120,000 words? And he said, no, 120,000 files. There's something like that. They were loading over a billion words into it. And <laughs> that was totally, it's going to take a while, but when yeah. they finally when it finally processed all that data and created this database, then it was working well for them. So they can work with really? very big corporate now. Yeah. Wow. That well, is, that's great. That, is... that's, that was really a funny story at the time. I didn't yeah. realize that the people would immediately start actually putting it, you know, stretching its limits. Um, but it's actually <laughs> working well for that. You know? Fun Christmas Day activity. Yeah, that, um, was, that was a crazy Christmas in, in, in 2020. The other big change was that it's now... You, you have this kind of uh, corpus manager interface, which is yeah. connected and connect online and, and it has some preloaded reference corpora as well, which yeah. you know, is something that is increasingly being offered by, by corpus tools. Yes. Um, you know, some of, particularly some of the browser based tools yeah. or commercial tools like sketch engine, obviously it's, it's mostly there for the reference corpora and they've got yeah, huge thing. And, 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 and now, you know, you see tools like, uh, Ancon and Langsbox as well, for instance, another uh, free concordancing tool, providing a small number of, of preloaded reference corporate. I'm assuming again, w was that for, you know, your own pedagogical purposes, oh, it's useful to have something inbuilt in the tool for when you're teaching, or was that more of a, a sort of response to corpus linguists asking for that feature? Uh, it's a combination of all of those really. First, it, it always comes back to my own teaching. So when I was teaching, uh, when I teach, I should say, um, often we want to do keyword analyses and as soon as you want to do keyword analysis, you need some kind of reference corpus and it's so much easier to just go to the, that corpus manager and just click on one of the reference corpora that are in there to, to giving you immediate access to a general English corpus and then you can generate keywords from that. So for my own classes, that was a huge step in simplifying the process of generating keywords. And of course, a lot of people in the field are using general corpora for reference. So adding it for other people as well was a benefit. And the idea is I would like Ancon to be a, a platform that people really can use to do, to, you know, to get started in corpus linguistics. And that means having access to, to general corpora like, like um, BEO6 and AMEO6. And there's a new version coming out, uh, AMI21 and B21. The corpus that you created, the, uh, the uh, spoken BNC, and adding that, uh, and then also adding maybe the ability for other people to upload their own corpora in, into the repository. So for other languages, like 
you know, Japanese, Chinese, Korean, or, uh, or you know, European languages and so on. So I really want to create a plat. I wanted to create a platform that would allow people to be able to upload whole corpora, not not lots of files, just as corpora is a single file as a database, and then be able to use that in their own work. So now with that corpus repository, um, it's very easy to just upload file, upload corpora, just give corpora to other people, exchange corpora, because it's just a single file database. I quite like that design. So we, you know, we're talking about some future developments, I suppose. So I, I, yeah. I want to ask uh, if there are any other future developments that you're able to share. I appreciate that you may not be able to give it many details, but recently, for example, I, I saw you you gave a, a, a paper at a, a conference and you were talking about um, integrating uh, uh, AI, essentially mm -hmm. uh, generative AI technology into into Ankonk and, and the sort of potential, the future potential for, for, for that sort of integration for corpus linguistics more, more yeah. broadly. So I'm assuming that is an upcoming feature that will be coming at some point soon, right? That's right. Well, first, what I was just talking about just now with the ability to upload corporate, download and share, that's already part of Ankong. That was introduced in 2020. But the next big, big um, feature, into, uh, feature will be the integration of AI. I've already presented, as you just said, I've presented it already and it's just about to come out, hopefully, uh, maybe by the time this podcast goes live. Uh, the idea is to into integrate um, a whole range of language models, um, the, like, like ChatGPT, but there are also open source models like Llama, and um, add those into Ankong, and that would allow people to first directly just talk to the language model as they do online with ChatGPT, uh, which, you know, some people are questioning the value of that um, and are the answers correct and, and what is the problem of hallucinations and so on. Um, but so that would be one thing you could do. The next thing you can do is also just switch the model very quickly. So you can compare the responses from different models, which would be an interesting insights. And I've seen a lot, an increasing amount of research on that. You know, what is the perform? How do these models perform? How, how do they work? Uh, if you can switch models easily and then also switch the parameters and switch the system prompts and the user prompts and so on, it will give us as corpus linguists a way to investigate how language models work, which I think is a very important thing that we should be getting involved with. So that's the second thing. But the third thing is that you could, well, with the with this new uh, chat AI, is what I call it, the feature, it will it's going to allow you to uh, basically uh, talk, well, ask, you can prompt the language model to to look at the results of traditional corpus methods and, and give insights on those. So in traditional corpus methods, we would perhaps generate a quick concordance output, keyword in context, or maybe we would output a set of collocates, or maybe lexical bundles and so on, or just a frequency list or a keyword list. And traditionally, we would look at those results and then try to introspect and, and make some observations and interpret the data and give some conclusions. What we can do with Chat AI in Ankong is basically ask the LLM to look at the data and give its own opinions about it. Now, of course, that's kind of odd as well. Why are we, why are we asking the, the AI model to look at this data? Why don't we just look at it ourselves? But as we've been finding, the language models have a, an incredible ability to to find patterns and, and make interesting observations, which we have to verify and confirm and so on. But it would allow the the researcher to use the model to um, inspect the results of traditional corpus tools, and and then look at those. But uh, coming right back to the data driven learning idea learners in the classroom can also do the same thing and they can instead of having to do complicated searches for example they can ask the LLM to do a search and uh, like can you tell me how you know what what uh, what tense should I be using in this writing and the LLM can then probe the results from say a quick concordance output and then tell them well in these results generally past tense is used past past so you kind of have this nice interplay between traditional corpus methods and then the, the power of the language model working together. And what I've found already, and I've reported this already, is that 
if a, a language model is looking at, at real data, real output from a corpus tool, the chance of it hallucinating and making false false assumptions drops significantly. Also research, there's also research that says that these these observations are, are kind of misleading sometimes. But it really depends on how you prompt the model, how you talk to the and what Ancon can can provide, the idea is to provide some well-tested prompts, so you have a prompt list as well, and you can also build in some sensible system prompts and so on. And it's all it's all part of a re, a, a, this new world of language modeling. So there's a lot of things that we still need to think about. But that's the idea. This sounds really cool, and 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 clearly is you know sort of riding the the wave of of, of AI that the generative AI yeah. that that has sort of been going for I suppose just over a year at at, at this stage. And, right. Um, I, I really look forward to to playing with with these new features when when the new update comes out. Um, right. yeah. As we start to to wrap up here, I, I'm sort of curious, you know, as, uh, going back to what you said earlier about it was never the the intention for you know Antcon to to have the role that it does well, now in terms of the broader and, field of corpus linguistics outside of your own in, your your own sort of interests in in teaching with with the tool, and, for instance. Um, and, and clearly, there are there are a number of a great number of tools now that that are available to, to researchers. Many of them free, and and many of them offer yeah. at least at, at their core a set of very similar functionalities. You know, concordance, in and collocation, keyness analysis, word list, etc. Uh, and then they might have additional sort of more unique yeah. sort of bells and whistles on top. But at their core, they they all more or less offer the same ish basic functionalities. Um, I, I suppose I'm interested in, do you, in your perspective, do, do you see, do, do you feel a sort of competitive nature? You know, do you feel yourself kind of wanting everyone to use Ankonk and, well, you know, not other tools or is it more just, no, no, no. I'm making this yeah. for me and if you want to use it, that's great. If you don't, I don't care because I'm, I've made it for me predominantly. Yeah. And okay. the more the merrier, you know. Do you see it as yeah. a bit of an arms race with you know adding in new oh, features okay. and sort of beating other other tools, or is it just who cares? Do what you want. You know, I'm doing uh, my tools. And that's it. Like that. So I would say first, there's definitely, in my view, there's certainly not an arms race or competition with other tools. Um, I was uh, um, way back in 2002 when I created the tool. You know, I was looking at the time I knew about Wordsmith tools by Mike Scott and Monocon Pro, uh, Mike Barlow. And, and I'm, I was inspired by those tools, and I've had a very nice relationship with Mike Scott um, all the since the beginning. Uh, he was actually my external examiner for my PhD. Uh, and you're talking about these core functions in Corpus tools. I think they're all being inspired by Wordsmith tools, um, and certainly mine tools have, and maybe even Micro Concord before that. Um, so I think uh, that if people look at Ancon, they probably think of Wordsmith tools as its direct competitor. But it, I know that Mike Scott um, it doesn't feel like that, and we're always talking about software development and how we can make things better. There's no competition at all in that way. Wordsmith tools is amazing, and um, it's a really good research tool, and strongly recommended for people if they're doing research in corpus linguistics. And Sketch Engine is another tool. Very, uh, it's a commercial tool, so it has a different audience. But it's a fantastic tool. I, I would strongly recommend it for people doing that kind of work. So I think all the software that we have in the world has their kind of unique features and the unique design. So it's not so much that I just build and crunk for myself and then if anybody wants to use it, they can. I'm not it's not quite like that. I definitely have my target user base and I would I want to create software for that user base the best I can. And I want to, you know, getting feedback from people is great. Um, I'm, but I'm not trying to out, you know, outperform some other tool that is out there in the world. I'm not trying to recreate Sketch Engine or recreate Wordsmith tools because they're great tools in their own respect, in their own in their own right. In, um, in, in, in some discussions, I I see uh, particularly at conferences, um, if somebody you know presenting a new tool, for instance, or a new update well, tool, sometimes I sense a bit of frustration among some researchers 
um, that there are so many different tools and why do we need yet another new tool that mostly does the same thing that other tools yeah. already do? Um, yeah. And why can't we all, you know, why can't we sort of merge and get get together and sort of have one big tool that does everything that everybody works together on? Do, do you sort of sympathize with that frustration or, or do, you, do you think it's right that it, it is essentially a free market, if you will, where, you know, anyone can develop anything and we have lots of different different tools and people should just be, you know, choose the one that they yeah. use. Or do you feel that there are kind of too many tools maybe or that it's maybe a bit confusing for someone who's new to corpus linguistics to kind of know what they're supposed yeah. to do? I, I, I definitely, um, I, I understand that concern um, because... For example, with concordances, every project seems to create a new web-based concordance for their own corpus. And that can be frustrating for a lot of people, I think. And maybe that's why people are you know, migrating towards Sketch Engine, which has a huge number of corpora and with, the, with a unified interface. And in some respect, I kind of do want to recreate that kind of experience for as a desktop tool with Ancong, where you can go to that and it has all the core functionality and all the corpora. And you can stay in the world of Ancon and do do your work, but I do understand also that you know, if in the world everybody has you know their own preferences and what they'd like and what they don't like, um, so I think from a user's perspective, I suppose it would be good to, for people to look at the software and maybe read the the initial the very beginning of guide and get a kind of understanding of the vision of the software that the creator has, uh, and I think if you read how these software tools work you will quite quickly see a different vision for the for these tools and um, so i can definitely talk about ankong's vision which is uh, an easy to use intuitive but powerful a uh, general purpose corpus analysis toolkit for multiple languages across all the operating systems so if you if you a, a user and you think oh I might be in a Mac room or I might have students with a Mac or a Windows computer and maybe I'm going to be using other languages at some point, then it's probably a good choice. Um, yes, yeah, like, yeah. That's the, that's the way to think about it. I think mm, that makes sense. I I I agree. You know, it, having one one tool that everybody uses may you know be 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 limiting. You know, in in the sense that as people say or you know uh, sort of almost all the time at conferences particularly you know and you should shouldn't be limited by what the, what the tools can do but you know you right. should do what you need to do for your research and if the tools can't do it you'll have to find yeah. some other way but but in practice obviously a lot, I, I, a lot of corpus linguists are you know they're not they're not uh proficient in in programming languages and and they are and they are literally limited by what the tools are called so maybe having Choice is is a good thing. Uh, you're more likely to maybe find what it needs needs to do for, mm -hmm. for you. Um, I, 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 as we as we wrap up now, I want to move to our final section, which is our uh, quick questions. Um, okay. And there are so many questions that I I would love to ask you, but I I, I will keep it to just three. Um, and and we'll we'll see how we do. So the first quick question, if you're ready, um, okay. As I always say, we'll see how quick the answer is. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, this I'll try a, to be as quick as I can. This is a yes-no question to begin with, actually. Okay. So, uh, okay. question one: Is research in corpus linguistics living up to its potential? Can I? And I can only answer yes or no. So I would say no. No. Okay. I mean, I'm breaking my old rules here, but I I kind of want to ask why. So go on. You can you can elaborate if you like. Okay. So the idea, from my view, that corpus linguistics is supposed to be this scientific, objective analysis of language. Whereas what we actually find is that people create corpora in many, many different ways. Some are representative of the target domain, some are pretty loosely related. Sometimes it's completely unrelated where people still use it. And when they do the analysis, they kind of look into the results and see what they want to see sometimes. Is. So well, keyword analysis is a good example. When you, when, when you generate thousands of keywords, it's then quite easy to go through that list of keywords and fish for the results that you want to see. So I think that's one of the weaknesses and the other is i feel that it's so focused on description of the corpus that is in front of you describing the corpus the model of language that you've created that it's easy to forget that you really need to be predicting what should be happening in the real world and um, producing you know useful applications of the results not just description of the model wow <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, 
it that 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 makes that makes sense to me. I mean, there, there must be there is a role for 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 description, surely in in, in some areas. Yes. If, if description yes. is the application, right? Like you know, I wouldn't lexicography, say for instance, is you know is is yeah, in that sense. Yes, yes, yes. I would say that would for lexicographers when you're trying to build a dictionary, which is a description of language, that's great. But I don't think corpus linguists really see themselves as just describing a model of language. No, I think they're trying to model. They're trying to understand the world. So, would would you say that? I mean, we're going completely off script here, but it's very interesting. I want to ask: more. Would, would you say that most corpus linguists are really applied corpus linguists in the majority, on the, in that sense? I, I I don't really know how to distinguish between applied and fundamental corpus linguists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, say that a lot of corpus linguists primary goal is to describe the features that they see in the corpus and but what the ultimate goal should be is to model to create a model of language from through description perhaps and then make predictions about the world that we that we live in oh okay so there's kind of a, a like a, a missing final step where yes. The, the findings are presented as here's here's what's in the corpus and isn't that interesting and but but we're sort of missing that final bit where we connect back to yes. reality which I suppose relies fundamentally on representativeness of of that's sample, right. which is that's right. notoriously tricky uh, that's for right. so many different reasons. So just um, so just as a, a simple example, I I want my students to be able to write good papers and present well. So that's my goal. So I might look at research papers in a corpus and understand the patterns that exist in the corpus, but ultimately I need to tell my students how to write a paper that gets accepted. So I need to take those results from the corpus and apply them in the real world and tell my students, if you write in this way, you're more likely to get accepted. And if they get accepted based on those, uh, that guide, then great. But if they're all getting rejected based on my analysis, then I need to go back and do better analysis. Yeah. So even if they're <laughs> writing in in the way that the corpus that you have is is suggesting, or, or your your interpretation suggests from the data that they're modeling yeah. from the data, but it's not successful, then then it doesn't matter if that how well they're they're mimicking the style of the exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I, I'm predicting that this way of writing is good. And uh, I can describe it. It's frequent. These patterns are frequent in the corpus. Yes, but is it what's going to make it successful in the real world? What is your real world goal? I suppose. I put it. Okay, that I, I'm I'm convinced. Uh, you know. I, <laughs> okay. Corpus <laughs> it's, it's corpus singers a great. You know, great. So it's not living up to its potential. But but you know, I think you I think you give very good reasons. Um, completely different question now. Quick okay. Question number two. What is your number one, so just one, I know you probably have okay. many, but what's your number one piece of advice for students embarking uh, on corpus research? It kind of relates to that question that you just asked, but I would say the number one advice is don't aim to describe the features of the corpus. <laughs> the aim should not be, this is what we find in the corpus. That should not be the aim of the research. But it should be modeling uh, the reality, sort of. It should from... have some application yeah. in the real yeah. world. Yeah. Okay. So have a have a have a research question that the corpus is a means to an end. It is not. The question is not what's in the corpus, but rather the corpus helps you to answer some question about reality. That's right. Okay. You, you did a lot of work in the, on the spoken BNC, so you, you're looking at how people communicate in the real world. So. How should we, you know, introduce ourselves to other people? Well, in the corpus, we see this, and 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 we see this. Yeah, great. But so, what should we do? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the kind of idea. I think it's 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 really interesting because I I, I think this this perspective. I, I you know I I mean I know that, that I know there are there are many of us who who uh, subscribe to the same view, but I think it's not necessarily the most sort of foregrounded or, or explicit or visible uh, perspective, because I think we get 
often caught up in the practicalities and the technicalities of working with the data that we can lose sight. Right. Um, yeah. but, but, you know, I, I, I think similar, sort of similar arguments from my interpretation of, of their book, you know, are made by, for instance, uh, Tony McHenry and Batsad Brasida in their fundamental principles of corpus linguistics book, where they sort of draw a lot on, on, um, sort of, well, philosophical, uh, uh, sort yeah, yeah. Of perspectives to, to, bring us back to what what is corpus linguistics as a science and 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 i think there are similar similar sort of points that that they're making there but again yeah. not necessarily if you're teaching corpus linguistics not teaching with corpus but corpus linguistics but actually teaching the methods of corpus linguistics it's very easy to lose sight of that and just focus mm-hmm. on okay here's how to do a keenness analysis here's how to you That's know right. upload your data yeah. here's how to collect your text yeah, and, yeah. So in simple terms, a corpus is just a model of language. And it's and you can describe or look at the model and describe the model in many, many ways um, ad infinitum. But ultimately, it's just a model. So what are you using that model to do? What's that model used for in the real world? I think that's great advice uh, for for new new uh, entrants into uh, corpus research so thank you uh final okay. question uh, okay. we've made we've made it to the end uh here we go um what will corpus research look like i will say uh, in the future i won't necessarily ask you 50 years 50 years is a long time and maybe impossible to say but so you can we can say five okay. years if you like but what will corpus research look like in the future i think there's two answers i'll try and keep it short but Pessimistically, I'll start with the pessimistic view. And the pessimistic view is that um, it will die because all the interest now in the world is on natural language processing with large language models. The world is, the world's attention is on la- la- large language models and how they work and what they can do and ha- what they predict. And b- b- it kind of replaces corpus linguistics in some way. Because it's a language model, which is like what a corpus is, and, but they have these incredible abilities and emergent properties, which are surprising everybody. So if all the attention moves to co- uh, to large language models, then where is the place for corpus linguistics? So that's a pessimistic view. Um, but opt- an optimistic view is that corpus linguistics researchers should really be informing this natural language processing research as well. We have been looking at corpora for many, many years, and some of the core ideas in these AI models are as similar to, to models that we've been to similar to the concepts that we've been using for many years as well. And I think we have a role to play in, you know, how to construct the the training data for these large language models, how to interpret the output of these large language models, and and so on. So an optimistic view is that we would work with the natural language processing people more and develop better models and um, that everybody can use. So there is a there is a definitely a possibility that that will be the direction to go, but I think it would it will require some kind of re rethinking about the role of corpus linguistics and also maybe you know accepting these large language models and the power that they have. Don't dismiss them straight away as because they sometimes hallucinate or they sometimes give strange answers. Maybe embrace that oddness and then think, oh, maybe that's a place that we can contribute and help to build even better models. Well, I, uh, for, for our own sake, um, I, 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 I will lean towards the optimistic view as well. Um, I would like to too. I, I think and hope that, that uh, you know, people who are, who are ultimately linguists, first and foremost, who are using corpus methods, should in my mind always be useful and 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 it shouldn't be possible to do linguistics without linguists <laughs> right. and we actually no, already no. see we're already seeing some research which kind of blends the two together with um, some corpus corpus linguist doing research with large language models and ai systems so we, we we see that bright future already starting to happen so i think the, the optimistic view is certainly one i would like to see happen Good. Well, on that note, I would really like to thank you, Lawrence, for your time, for, for joining us on Corpus Cast today. It's been such a pleasure to get the chance to uh, hear more about your own story and about Ant Conk and, and your views on the on, on the landscape uh, in Corpus Linguistics. So thank you so much. Uh, You're really, very welcome. It's been, it's been really enjoyable talking to you too. 
And thank you to our listeners and viewers as well, of course. That's it for this episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you for joining us on your platform of choice, be it YouTube or Spotify or wherever else it is you get your podcasts. And in the meantime, do let us know your thoughts uh, using the hashtag Corpus Cast. Uh, and make sure to check out the Aston Corpus Linguistics Research Group on X at Aston Corpus. And you can follow me at Love a Mob. Uh, Corpus Cast is an Aston Originals podcast hosted by me, Robbie Love, and produced by Sam Cook. And with that, thanks again uh, to the listeners and viewers. Thanks again to today's guest, uh, Professor Lawrence Anthony, Western University. And we'll see you soon on the next episode of Corpus Cast. Thank you. <laughs>